Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. If you have a different translation, it should be very similar. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Hear the word of the Lord. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, as we come to this time of the service where your word is expounded and applied to our lives, Lord, I pray that we would be attentive to your word, that your Holy Spirit would quicken our hearts and illuminate our minds as we hear the inspired word of God. And Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross because as always, I feel as the weak link here in this process where your word goes to your people. And so Lord, I pray that you would overcome my weakness, my frailty and my stuttering and all the rest, and that your word would go forth to your people and you would build up your church and your people would be edified and strengthened and conformed into the image of Christ. And if there is anyone here this morning, Lord, that is still a stranger to your grace, Lord, I pray that you would do that miracle of the gospel and stab alive their dead heart, open their blind eyes and open their deaf ears and drag them to yourself for their good and for your glory. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. Well, it was the first Sunday in this year, in January, that we began walking through the letter to the Colossians, verse by verse, slowly but surely, and yes, we will, Lord willing, get to chapter 4, as Larry said, eventually, if the Lord tarries. But as we have done so here over a half of a year, I hope that you've been able to see, those of you that have been with us, that the Apostle Paul's emphasis under the inspiration of of the Holy Spirit has been Christ. Nothing else. Christ and Christ alone. That's been his focus, his attention, trying to get our eyes off of other things. And the, 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 the church at Colossae there was being distracted by other issues that he's going to be dealing with as in the coming weeks as we walk through it. Some of the heresies that are creeping into the church that is distracting them away from Christ. And he's wanting to emphasize that. And as we saw last week, as we spent in, uh, the, the entire sermon last week on verse 6 that I just read for us, and we'll summarize that a little bit to make sure that we are getting the context here. He is making a hinge here now. He is saying, because of all of these things... Walk in Christ. That's his command because he understands, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he understands the distractions of this world. And oh, are we distracted, aren't we? We're drawn away by so many different things. Things that are on the national stage, things that are, some of us live on, some of you live on the news all the time, watching the news, keeping up with things, and that can get, oh, that can get overwhelming and very stressful to the frustrations of life and everything in between. I'm talking about things that are very important. Some things are very important. I'm not minimizing any, any of these things at all. National politics are very important. Some of the things that we're talking about on a daily basis are very important. Abortion, same-sex marriage, transgenderism, socialism, the things that are happening in Russia and the Ukraine, in China, in North Korea, here locally with, with, with mass, uh, or in our country, mass shootings, or here locally even drive-by shootings, to traffic, to what's going to be for dinner, to the economy and inflation and the rising cost of living and how we're going to pay the bills and make ends meet to finding a parking spot at home at, at, at Walmart or Home Depot or Lowe's, wherever we are. To the frustra little frustrations of life, to the big frustrations of life. Broken air conditioners, busted pipes, flooded homes. Trouble at work, trouble at home, 
trouble at school, family members that do stupid things, getting ready for school to start in the fall, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, AI, and all the other things that are in our daily lives that we are concerned with, whether or not there's going to be any kids showing up for vacation Bible school, or whether or not too many kids are going to show up for vacation Bible school, or whatever might be on our plate at the time, what's happening at home while I'm away, and what's happening over there when I'm not looking, and what's going on in my family, and all of these other things. What the Apostle Paul is saying in the book of Colossians, do not forget that Christ is supreme over it all. He must have the preeminence. That is why he has reminded us in chapter 1 that Christ is the image of the invisible God. That's why he reminded us that he is the creator of all things. That's why he reminded us he is the sustainer of all things. He is all in all and he is over all things. Therefore, it's in what he says in verse 6, therefore, because you have received all of these things, that because you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. As we said last week, everything up until this point has just been statements. There's been the indicative, if you want to put it that way. It's facts. Notice, he has not given us one command. The Apostle Paul has not commanded one thing until he gets to verse 6 of chapter 2 and he says, walk in him. No other command. Everything has been praising God, pr praying for the, the, the saints there in Corinth, and by implication, the, what is God is going to be doing in the world, started doing in the world then, and flowing out of that, he's been praising God and making statements in the indicative, and they have been rejoicing about the finished work of Christ on the cross, this work that they had understood and they had received. He had praised God for their faith. He had praised God for their love. He had praised God for their hope. And he says, based on all of those things, therefore, walk in him. I think I was probably in high school when I first heard this little saying. There's a couple of older guys in our church, and one of the men said, ask the other one, how are you doing? And the other guy said, well, pretty good under the circumstances. And the first guy said, well, that's your problem right there. What are you doing under the circumstances? Now, no wonder you're not doing too good under the circumstances. Well, get out from under there. What are you doing under there? And so I've heard people use that joke all the time. You're under the circumstances. No wonder you're doing bad. You're under the circumstances. Get out from under the circumstances and walk in Christ. Now, Paul knew and I knew and you know that's easier said than done. That's why he doesn't start in verse 1 with that command, walk in him. We say, how do we do that with all of the other uh, things in life and all of the stresses and all the frustrations and all of the difficulties and when, when, when life gets hard and it does? You can't just bite your lip, grin and bear it, and move forward. That's not Christianity, that's Stoicism. Christianity is built upon a firm foundation of Christ. Just to summarize, if you weren't here last week, and, and if you've been keeping, if you miss and you keep up on our on uh, the video, I apologize. The video from last week did not get posted. We had some technical difficulties, Larry, and that uh, didn't get recorded. But but to, just to summarize what we looked at last week in verse six, as you see it there in your text, the Apostle Paul is saying, just as you have received Christ, you have received Christ. And I, I got a little nitpicky, I, I I admit, on the difference between receiving Christ. And and accepting Christ. And, 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 and I mean, I know there's sort of a little slight nuance of meaning there, but as I said, I think too often we're worried about, we're worried about people accepting Christ. We need to be more concerned about Christ accepting you. That, that's what we need to be concerned about, is, is Christ accepting us. That's what we need to be concerned about. Is, is we're not in charge. It's not our terms. It's his terms. And he is the one. We can, God, and Christ is not going to accept us on our merit, on our terms. It's on his terms. And so 
and even more concerned, it's more important that Christ accepts us. But it is true that the the Apostle Paul is saying that these folks had received Christ Jesus, the Lord. They had received him. Not not just by way of salvation, we use that terminology, but they received this this statement, this title that, that the Apostle Paul focuses our attention on here in Verse 6, and I'm going to have to resist preaching that whole sermon over again because it is so rich as he says, you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Christ Jesus the Lord. I pointed out uh, that there is one word there in the Greek that does not come across in English, and that's just uh, without getting into the details again, the technicalities of the two different uh, languages and the syntax there, but there's an extra definite article in the apostle that came from the apostle Paul's pen. He says, the Christ, the Christ. You have received the Christ. And I think there's an exclusivity that he is pointing out there. There is only one Christ. Christ. And of course, we look at the word Christ, meaning the anointed one. It's Messiah in the Old Testament in Hebrew. Christ it comes across into the English from the Greek. It is the anointed one. And we looked at the three offices in the Old Testament that were anointed that of prophets, that of priests, and that of kings. So prophets, priests, and kings were the ones who were anointed under the, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. And we see how Jesus is our prophet, priest, and king above all else. He is the better prophet, better than Moses, as, as Moses mentioned in Deuteronomy, that a better prophet than him would come. And Jesus, of course, is that better prophet. Not just, not just a prophet, but a, the, a, not just a spokesman for God, but is God. And the very word of God, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And so Jesus is that prophet, the very word of God. He is our high priest, as Hebrews says, under the, after the order of Melchizedek, he is our high priest. There is no mediator between God and man, but the man Christ Jesus. He is our high priest. And of course, he is our king, the king of kings and Lord of lords, fulfilling uh, the the promises of the Davidic covenant that he will sit on the throne of David forever. And so the apostle Paul uses this term as to point to Jesus, the Christ. So that's the first word we looked at last week, Christ. He says, Jesus, two quick things I'm reminded of that we looked at last week. And this is so important, I I think it bears repeating, that we saw Jesus, remember Jesus is his personal name. That's what he was known by. That's what his mother called him. Uh, I did did think, I hope this doesn't sound sacrilegious or breaking the third commandment, but I wonder when, when Mary called Jesus in for dinner, I wonder if the neighbors thought she was cussing. You know, I, I don't know. I'm just saying. No, I won't even say it. But you, you know what I'm saying? That's his name. That's what he was known by, is Jesus. And so it reminds us of Jesus' humanity, that he was human. He's 100% God and 100% man. And so the Apostle Paul makes sure that we hear this human name of Jesus. But in addition to that, the fact that that's just his human name, that's the name, that was his given name, that's the name that he went by. It's his given name by his parents because God gave him that name, because God told his parents he shall be called Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. The word Jesus means Savior. The word Jesus means Savior, one who saves. And so it reminds us that we are lost in our trespasses and sin. We need saving. And we are are, are in need of salvation. Jesus Christ comes to earth, lives a sinless life, and dies on the cross to pay the penalty of the sins of all who would receive him by faith, who would repent and trust in him. He died and was buried on the third day, rose from the grave, proving that he is victorious over sin, held death in the grave, proving that the sacrifice has been paid in full. That is Jesus, the Savior. And so he says, the Christ, Jesus, the Lord. And as he puts those three words together, it is packed with meaning. As he is not only King of kings, he is Lord of lords. And just to remind you, in the first century, remember in the secular world, the secular mind, the statement that was on everyone's lips was, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. Uh, Caesar was the, the Lord. And so they would say, Caesar is Lord. But the Christians... 
the countercultural Christians said, we're not going to use your preferred, pron- your preferred nouns. We're not going to use your preferred titles. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And so as they said, Jesus is Lord, many of them went to the stake. Many of them went to the lions. Many of them lost their heads because they were willing to say, Christ Jesus the Lord. And the Colossian church had received all that that title meant. All of the implications as we spend our entire lives understanding it all and researching it all and figuring it all out. They had received it. You have received it. You as a believer this morning. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, I want you to hear the Apostle Paul's imperative. Walk in him. He's making this very positive here as he says walk in him. But let me flip it around and make sure that you hear the full weight of that by saying stop walking in the cares of this life. Stop walking in the philosophies of this world. Stop walking in the things that are trending on social media. Stop walking on the things that were saturated in uh, by the news. Stop walking under those circumstances. Walk in him. You see what, Christ, what Paul was saying? He says walk in him. Just to remind you, we've mentioned that Charles Virgin pointed out that this walking here, it's a metaphor, sure, and we don't want to push the metaphor too far. However, it does imply a few things. It implies activity. It implies activity. You can't walk uh, without activity. There's movement uh, there. And so when the Apostle Paul uses this metaphor of walking, he's implying activity. And without sounding overly facetious or overly uh, condemnatory, I think that so many Christians neglect the means of grace. They neglect the spiritual disciplines. They don't gather for corporate worship. They don't read their Bibles. They don't spend time in prayer. They don't tithe. They don't serve others. They don't do any of those things. There's no spiritual activity in their lives. And then they wonder why they're not getting anywhere. That pun was intended, by the way, if you didn't catch it. Walking, you're going to get somewhere. And Paul wants you to get somewhere. He wants you to move from wherever you are under those circumstances and get out from under them by walking in him. As he starts to put legs on that metaphor and explaining what all of that means, we move into verse 7. And and if you have your Bible there, I want you to see verse 7. I want to kind of pick it apart. It's a short verse, but there's there's so much meaning there. And I'll go ahead and sort of give you uh, uh, the outline of it because there's four key words uh, here in Verse 7, that I, want, that I don't want you to miss. There are four key words. And um, uh, for those that are, that are familiar with seventh grade grammar, I'll go ahead and tell you, they're participles. Uh, four participles. Uh, no, not popsicles. They're participles. Uh, so I know some of you will say, participle? What's a participle? He said popsicles or something. No, participles. Don't worry about that. That's not going to be on the test. The important thing is there's four words here that are important. The first word that I want you to see is receiving. The receiving. The second word, by the way, is built up. And then the third one is established. And then the fourth one is overflowing. So that's kind of where we're going. I want you to see that. And so the first one, notice what he says. He's, he says, rooted in him. How, how are we to walk? Being rooted in him. This is an agricultural metaphor. An agricultural metaphor. He's using several different metaphors. And we'll kind of see the context where these metaphors are coming from. This agricultural metaphor is something being rooted. We see that oftentimes in Scripture. I think of especially in Psalm 1. In Psalm 1 where it says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffer, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law doth he meditate both day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. If you notice in Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah, uh, that 
as Mr. Rob read for us just a moment ago, Jeremiah picks up on this and basically quotes a portion of Psalm 1 there in his prophecy in Jeremiah 17. As he talks about how the ungodly is like a shrub that's going to wither up and die, but a blessed man, a godly man, a righteous man is going to be rooted it's going to be rooted. And the Apostle Paul builds upon that analogy that the Old Testament writers are writing about. And he says, when we are rooted, we need to be rooted in Christ. That Christ is the soil in which our roots are gaining substance. That Christ is the, is the, is, is the substance in which we are rooted into. We're gaining nourishment from the soil. We're gaining stability from the soil. Christ, we are rooted in Christ. Just to, to remind us about this analogy that the Apostle Paul is using. Some of y'all know that I experiment with gardening. Uh, I notice I say, I, 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 like to, I like to garden. I don't do a whole lot of it, but I like to experiment. Probably way too much because most of my experiments fail. Uh, actually, I'm very successful in knowing how not to do certain things. And so uh, I, I try a lot of different things. Now, one thing that you know that if any of you garden, one of the, th the things that we have to battle with all the time is weeds, right? And so I do know that a great way to handle weeds is by card using cardboard and mulch. I love cardboard and mulch. I, I, I love that more than growing the plants. I don't know why, I just love it. it cardboard will deteriorate, it'll, it'll decompose, it's good for the worm food and everything. And so you put the cardboard down, you put mulch on top of it, and it works great. Uh, but however, this year I experimented with it a little bit too much. Larry, what I did was, I put, I have a raised bed back here that we didn't grow anything in last year, and so it was full of weeds, so I pulled as many of the weeds out as I possibly could and put a layer of cardboard down, and then about two inches of compost and peat moss over that, and this planted ochre right in on top of that. The theory was, as I've been able to see that cardboard deteriorate so quickly down here, uh, especially when it rains and there's water and it gets wet and it deteriorates pretty quickly, uh, I was hoping that it would keep the weeds down, but the roots from the okra would grow through the cardboard from the top down. You know, that was a good theory. Apparently that doesn't work. Uh, my okra is still alive, but it's only about this tall. Uh, and so that didn't work. Be why? Because they didn't have a place to get the roots in, you see. And so, and so uh, the Apostle Paul wants us to flourish. He wants us to thrive. Using the analogy that we see there in Psalm 1 and in Jeremiah 17 of a tree that has deep roots that doesn't get blown over when the wind comes and is able to get down into the water table and is nourished by its soil. Christ said, if you're walking in him, you're being rooted in him. So you see how he mixes these metaphors. He likes to kind of mix metaphors and, and add metaphor on top of metaphors. So he uses this agricultural metaphor, but then he also uses an architectural metaphor uh, in the next word. He said, built up in him. So sort of like building a house, you know, that's you're, you're, you're building a structure and there's things that are happening and there's progress that is being made. And sometimes you can notice the progress and sometimes you don't notice the progress. Uh, right, Mart? Mart's a, a builder and I know that we've built a lot of houses and you see, uh, especially the framing, it goes up real fast and you think, oh wow, this house almost done. And then, and then weeks and weeks later, uh, you know, and especially when you get down to the finish and the punch list and everything, it seems like it takes forever. And that's how it is in our Christian life. Sometimes things go well, quickly, and it's obvious, and you can see sometimes you don't know what's exactly going on, and you just have to move forward by faith. But I think that what Paul is doing more than anything here, and by, by the way, we, we can elaborate on being built on a good foundation and all the rest and all, all of that talk, but what I want you to see is exactly how Paul is using it in this context. I think that he's using this as a word pair. Notice, even though most of the commentators point out, feel the, the difference in the mixing of the metaphors. One's an agricultural metaphor and one's an architectural metaphor. And there seems to be a little bit incongruency there. But I think what Paul is doing here, if you think about it, he's talking about being rooted. That's what happens underneath the surface. And then he's being, you're being built up what's happening above the surface. And so he's including everything. He's wanting to have a well-rounded thing that Christ is all in all. That, he, that Christ is supreme over the things that you can see, the things that are being built up, and the things that you can't see, the things that are down rooted deeply. You, you, you see? And so it's everything. 
And so he's covering all the bases as he makes this word pair that we're rooted in Christ and we're being built up in Christ. And then the third metaphor that he uses here is, well, the, the third participle that he uses here that I think is a metaphor as well. well. We'll see. He says established. Or maybe your translation may say strengthened. It's interesting. If you do a word study here, uh, this word is sometimes used in the legal realm. In, in business, in, in, in legal transactions and things. As, as, when it's talking about the, the context would be something like being guaranteed. Like say, say there's a contract or, or a, a, a agreement that's being made and it's being established. It's being guaranteed. This is a sure thing. This agreement is strong and strengthened and there's a, a strong tie or partnership there. That's the context that sometimes this is being used. And I, I think that's what Paul is getting at here when he's talking about being rooted and being built up and being established. Uh, that, that is there. It is, it is sure. It is guaranteed. It is firm. That's what he's talking about when you are in Christ. Now you're rooted in something else, you're going to get blown away. You're rooted in something else, you're not going to be nourished. You're built up on a different foundation, you're going to fall like sinking sand. But if you are rooted in Christ and being built up in Christ, you're established in Christ. You see, all of these things come together. And it's interesting, by the way, before we get to the fourth word that he uses here in verse 7, let me give you another little nitpicky thing about the grammar that Paul is using here. The first, the first word that he uses is, a, is, is a, without going into the, the, the syntax and all ex exactly, but the, the, the tense is that something that has happened in the past and has future ramifications for the future. So being rooted in him is something that has happened. You're being rooted and it has ongoing effects, you see. And, and then the, the other three words are all in the present tense. That these are continual action. Just like walking is continual action. Being, being rooted, st started once, you're rooted, but then you keep, you keep growing. Like, you're, like you transplant a tree. You know, you transplant it, it's planted there, you did that a one-time thing. However, it continues to grow. The roots continue to spread. It continues to get nourishment. And being built up, that's an ongoing process that you're never finished with. Being established is something that you never need to just say, okay, well, that's done. That's over. Doesn't need to be worked on anymore. No, walking is a continual process. It's ongoing. You can't say, I'm going to grow in my faith the first year after I'm saved, and then afterwards I'll just coast along. No, it, it always takes work. I, I love what Chuck Kelly, the former president of New Orleans Baptist uh, Seminary, used to always talk about. It was one of his, 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 his uh, illustrations that he loved to use. How do you keep a fence, a uh, white picket fence, how do you keep it white? You don't do it by just letting it sit there. Okay, don't touch it. It's white, so now you just leave it alone. You don't ever touch it again, and it'll stay white. No, you know what will happen uh, to a white fence. Well, the same thing will happen to a white church building. Uh, if you don't ever touch it, uh, it, it'll get green, right? It'll get dirty. You have to continually wash it. You have to continually paint it. You have to continually attend to it. Uh, that's how you keep things the same, by always having activity. And so we're growing in Christ in that regard. It's always something. But then another interesting thing about these uh, uh, participles that he is using there, uh, these first three are all passive. What I mean by passive is someone else is doing the action and you're receiving the action. If I just lost you there, let me just, it's, not, it's not as difficult as you might think. Is that when he says you're being rooted, you're not doing the rooting, you're being rooted. So somebody else is doing, you're being rooted. Christ is doing the rooting, you're being rooted. So you see, that's what passive means. Uh, and, and, then, and, then, and then he says, being built up, you're not doing the building. We don't do the building. Christ does the building. Christ does the building. We're being built up. And we don't do the establishing. We can't establish things. We can't guarantee things. It's Christ doing the guaranteeing. You see, it's Christ doing the establishing. Does that make sense? Shake your head like this if that makes sense. You see, Christ is doing these things. So these uh, first three participles are passive. But then he gets to the fourth one, abounding or overflowing. That one is active. That is something that you are going to do. You are going to overflow. As just as you have received Christ, Jesus the Lord. 
And you walk in him and you hear that admonition. You hear that imperative. You hear that command. Walk in him. And as you are walking, as Christ is working in you both the will and to do for his good pleasure, he's the one that is giving you the power. He's the one doing the strength. But you're still doing the walking. You're doing the walking. And as you are walking, he is rooting you in Christ. He is building you up in Christ. He is establishing you in Christ. Or actually, before we get to overflowing, let me fill out, finish out that phrase there before I rush past it. Because he says, established in the faith that you have been taught. You're established in the faith that you have been taught. So you're walking in Christ. You're being rooted in Christ. You're being uh, built up in him. And you are being uh, established in the faith that you have been taught. Now notice there's a definite article there too, the faith, the faith. And and, and I think it's important to point out that whenever you see the word faith in the New Testament, it kind of has two different uses. And and think about it. One, faith, uh, I mean, they overlap. They're they're very similar, but see if this makes sense. Uh, Faith, we we can talk about having faith, you know, having trust. You're trusting something. You know, so in in a a verb sense that you are having faith in something. That's your faith. But then, with a definite article, the, especially in English, the faith, you're talking about a body of beliefs, the content of what you believe, the doctrines. It's the same usage that we see elsewhere in Scripture where the Bible tells us to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. This is the body of doctrine. This is the theology. So theology matters. I know you hear me beat that drum all the time. But theology matters. Doctrine is important. It is the thing that's going to root us in Christ. It's the thing that's going to build us up in Christ. It's the thing that's going to establish us in him. It's that body of doctrine, that theology that we have been taught. That we have received, that the Colossians have received the faith. That's why I believe it's important. We, we believe it's important here at Lakeshore Baptist Church to be confessional. We have, we have two primary confessions here at Lakeshore Baptist Church that we hold dear. The Baptist Faith and Message 2000, which is our Southern Baptist statement. It's a more modern statement, a more uh, easily accessible statement, a broader statement. And then also the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. You notice that's a little older, a little bit more detailed, and a little bit more historic. And so we see those two being very helpful. But you notice in the title of those, both of those things, you have that word faith. And we're using it in the same way that the Apostle Paul is using the faith. That we have been established in the faith. That's why we call it the Baptist faith and message. This is what we believe. This is what we believe. Or the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. This is what we are confessing. This is our faith. This is what we believe. This is the content of what we believe based upon Scripture. Scripture is the authority, not the confessions, not the creeds. The the Scripture is the authority. But they are very helpful tools to be able to profess and to confess what we believe. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, look, these doctrines are important. It helps us to stay on track in our walk. It's the soil that we're rooted in when we say Christ Jesus the Lord. We can't say that without explaining our theological understanding of it all. We, can't, we have to say which Jesus? The Jesus that, that of our own imaginations or the Jesus of Scripture? And so as we have received Christ Jesus the Lord, and as we are walking in him, as he is rooting us in him, as he is building us up in him, as he is establishing us in the faith that we have received, he says, then he closes with this verse in abounding in thanksgiving. Abounding in thanksgiving, overflowing in thanksgiving. And I guess this is maybe a civil engineering meta, a meta, a metaphor, I don't know. But it's, the idea there is like a river that's overflowing its banks. Because the, the, See, that's, that's, the, the, that's what's going to happen as this all takes place. You're going to overflow with thanksgiving. 
The banks of your thanks, thankfulness is going to overflow. You're not just going to have a little bit of thanksgiving. You're going to have a lot of thanksgiving. It's going to overflow in thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is one of the Apostle Paul's favorite themes. He actually talks about giving thanks six different times in just the book of Colossians. Just the letter to the Colossians. Six different times. He, 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 elsewhere he explains how the nature of a Christian is to be thankful. That's what Christians do. That's just what they naturally do. That's what they supernaturally do, I guess I could say. Or, or as I like to say, the, the, the new heart that God gives us as a believer, when he gives us a new heart, that new heart has some characteristics, right? One of the things that that new heart does is has a characteristic. It beats with faith in Jesus Christ. I say that all the time. It beats with faith in Jesus Christ. But it has other characteristics too. And one of them is it's thankful. It's thankful. It gives thanks. That's what a Christian heart does does now we talk about this so often it's easy just to go through the motions and talk about having an attitude of gratitude and all of those types of things but let's punch past the sloganeering and let's pause for a second and hear what the apostle paul is saying that when we are rooted and built up and in him and established in the faith we're going to overflow with thanksgiving we're going to be like a river that's overflowing its banks. That's how much thanksgiving we're going to have, how much gratitude we're going to have in our heart. Not just a little eyedropper of gratitude, a whole river of gratitude. And it's amazing to me, and, and I know this is going to sound condemnatory, I really don't mean for it to be, but I want you to understand it, how many times we as believers will sit through an entire sermon about having an attitude of gratitude, an entire sermon about giving thanks, and we'll say amen to it all, all while we're complaining about the air conditioner. Or we drive out and we complain about the person who just pulled us off, or the person that's going too slow in front of us. Instead of saying, okay, let's, let's get real. You're driving down, the, you leave church, you're driving down the street, and some car is, you're in a hurry to get, you're hungry and you're ready to eat. Brother Don's preached way too long, and you want to eat, get something to eat, and, you, and you're going down the road, and somebody's slow in front of you, and you're like, oh. Instead of being grateful and thankful that you have a car, grateful and thankful that you have gas in your car, grateful and thankful for where you just came from, thankful or grateful that where you're about to go, a thousand reasons to be grateful and thankful, but instead you are consumed with that one person going too slow in front of you. You see, you see what Paul is saying? You know why we do that? Because we're under the circumstances. We're under the circumstances that are around us. They're going too slow. There's no parking spot here. I can't believe what they did. And all of these things were under these circumstances. But if we walk through what the scriptures have for us today, this, the, 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 the Apostle Paul is laying forth in front of us that we have received Christ Jesus the Lord. And he has given us a new heart. And he has given us new legs. And he has given us a vision of him. And we can walk in him. We are well rooted and are gaining the nourishment from a deep theological foundation that is under our feet. That flows up from the scriptures through our confessions and out our mouths to the glory of God. Established and abounding in thanksgiving. Because of all this, I encourage us all. To walk in him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I do thank you and praise you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you and praise you for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may we drink deeply from this well. And Lord, that we would not walk under our own strength. Or walk in the philosophies of this world. But that we would walk in Christ. Root us in Christ. Build us up in Christ. Establish us in the faith of Christ. And may we overflow with thanksgiving to Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.